The small village of Soa, Ohio, dates back to the early 1800s. The religious separatists who settled this land came from my neck of the woods in southern Germany and thrived for years as a communal society. In this episode, I'll be joining the great people of Saar to learn more about the community's trials and tribulations over the years. We'll prepare some classic German dishes such as goulash, Eggeisbeuger Marsch mit Spätzle and Rostbraten. I'll also learn how to make the famous Saar pretzel. All for a taste of history. Wow, spectacular. I am so excited to be here today cooking the Zohar. And guess what? I have Michelle with me. Michelle. Nice say, to meet you. We're excited to have you here at Zohar. I'm excited that you're here so you can explain me a lot more. Just you know, the recipes I'm making today, I have never made on the show. They are, my, they are my recipes when I get homesick. You know, I come from the same part of the world that the separatists came from near Ulm. Actually, I went to school near Ulm. Think about that. Not only are these recipes close to your heart, they're close to the hearts of the people that settled in this village. Today's recipes, we start off with a goulash. I have what you call a New York strip. This is like a half a loin. I'm cutting the end of that. There we go. And then basically all I'm cutting it in any kind of dice. And again, the smaller the dice, the more people you can feed. You might wonder why there's so much onion in there. Uh, and this is that the soup. Technically, when you make it, you do not use any flour, but I do recommend sometimes incorporate cornstarch corn starch in the end, just as a, as a slurry, you know. You can chop me this garlic here. We have very special potatoes in Germany that you cannot find here. So the closest you can find is the Yukon Golds, which are those ones. Is that good, Chef? Perfect. So we got the meat, we got some salt. Salt? Good amount of pepper. pepper. I'm caramelizing the meat. Now, obviously, this is a very tender meat because it's New York strip. You see the meat? Take a look how far this oven, or that hard, I should say. It's really great. Now I'm going to put the onions into it. The onions we want to caramelize. This one over here is going to take a little bit more. Like the meat is already literally done, believe it or not. But the onions need to redo some more. So now I'm going to put a nice big spoon of tomato paste in there. Now, as I said, paprika, you want to use Hungarian paprika for that. When you add the paprika, you got to make sure your stock is ready. And so the that same you can time, add yeah, it. Exactly, otherwise it burns. Now, in reading your recipe, you cook that down a little bit before you add the next flavor, Correct. right? There's so much heat in this one over here. We are, we, we are cooking with overdrive. Red wine in there. You want to get a good red wine. This happens to be a Cabernet Sauvignon, anything like that. You don't want anything sweet in there, though. The pepper flake is like a modern invention. And some people like this really hot, easy on the pepper flake. We can always add, you can never take out. The stock I made earlier. So Michelle, now comes the most important part of the goulash soup. We have caraway seed, stick of butter. We've just taken a little bit of the lemon peel. If you take caraway seed and you would want to just chop it, fly they all fly over. everywhere. Right? So the butter kind of binds it and also gets more flavor into it. You can throw the potatoes in the soup now. You still get your tasting spoon there. You want the meat not completely overcooked, you want to get a little, a little bit, um, five more minutes. A little bit. Yeah, try to figure. Pretty good. By the time the potato is ready, it is ready. We're gonna take that, put it all on top of the knife, hold on. And you wanna take this over there, be careful, don't fall in the knife. You're not gonna add it into the soup yet. And it's a good amount of salt and it needs a good amount of cracked pepper. And it needs a little bit more of the pepper flakes. Taste it one more time. Wow. That's good. Now when this goes in, 
that takes it over the top. If you never have done it before, this is the trick. I think the stove added to it. Oh no, the stove and the spirits. I feel them. Do you not feel them here? The, the people, feeling people, of the people that people found telling, this people, village. And people are telling me, keep on going, come back. So now it's ready, we can take it off to the side. It's, it's gonna simmer a little bit more because paprika is very dangerous. If you leave this under fire, walk away five minutes, could burn. It settles to the bottom, it's like no, curry. Don't. Then I'm gonna show you how Black Forest style spatula are made off the board. In the early 19th century, a group of religious separatists that would become known as Zorites found themselves at odds with the Lutheran Church in Württemberg, Germany. The Zorites did not like the, the ceremony of the Lutheran Church. They did not believe in infant baptism. They did not want to send their children to the state school, which was run by the Lutheran Church, and they didn't believe in military service. Their beliefs were an intolerable offense that resulted in imprisonment, beatings, and confiscation of property and children. In 1817, roughly 250 separatists set out for the United States. Upon arrival in Philadelphia, the Quakers welcomed them with open arms, securing them employment and eventually loaning them a substantial piece of land in Ohio. The name of Zor means place of refuge in Hebrew, and uh, it was their place of refuge from persecution in, in Germany. When they came in 1817, they had not really thought about forming a communal or cooperative society. They found life here quite a bit more difficult than they expected. Obviously, it wasn't you know, as developed as what they had left in Germany. With the Zorites struggling to find ways to pay off their debt and support their own society, their livelihood looked grim. And so in 1819, they decided the only way they were gonna really make it here in this kind of wilderness was to come up with a different form of operating, and so they became a communal society and it became very quickly apparent that everybody had to contribute to this. Women participated in every aspect of Zora society, including working the fields and even politics. For a brief period, women even abstained from having children in favor of working to support the community as well as keep the population from growing beyond its means. Every house in Zor was assigned a number so that everything the community produced could be organized and distributed evenly. There were various places where items were distributed. Those items were all somewhat rare in the 19th century here in the wilderness of Ohio. If you wanted spices, sugar, salt, they were metered out pretty carefully. In 1825, good fortune struck the community when the state of Ohio began construction on the Ohio Erie Canal connecting Lake Erie and the Ohio River. By good luck, seven miles of that canal came through the land of the Society of Separatists. Most importantly, they got to dig those seven miles, and the payment for that gave them enough money to pay off their loans. Now debt-free, this new shipping route along the canal also provided Zor a very prosperous life for decades to come. So Michelle, welcome to the Spätzle workshop. Well, I'm excited about this because I've seen you make it before, but I've never been able to perfect it. Let me tell you something. This is like, uh, we call it the motherhood and apple pie in the Black Forest. And nobody, now obviously, but in the early days, nobody would make it different than off the board. And any restaurant, and where I was an apprentice, there was a job every day. The three of us, four of us, we would have a, a stove a little lower than that, big pot. And you stand there and you talk stories and you just go, 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 go. And when the pot is full, you take it out and then you and I discussed it before, the water. Yeah, this door back here is actually the laundry. The spatzli that they would make for lunch, that water would be used as their starch. The trick to making good spatzli is the flour. So it's a high gluten flour. And basically what you're doing is in making the spatzli dough, you awaken the gluten and crack a bunch of eggs right in the well. About 10 of them? Uh-huh. Nothing but fresh nutmeg ground. And then salt, a couple of pinches of salt. So now all I'm gonna do is slowly mix it all together. Notice I have no water in there yet. Correct. And the uh, less water, the better for the spatzlet. You can give me like a half a cup of water in the hole. I should do it. The water helps to dilute it. 
What consistency are we looking for, Chef? Uh, uh, elasticity. Elasticity. Working up that gluten. So we let it sit for a little bit, and then we go back into it again, give a chance of the flour to moisten. It's pretty, pretty much there already. Do you want me to check the water, Chef? Please. It should be ready. Oh, it's wonderful, Chef. It's perfect. Put in a, a little bit of oil, like a two tablespoon, not even. There we go, put this away. Okay, so now you see the board I got is beveled on the end. Now this you can use a knife, you can use a spatula, you can use whatever, it really makes no difference. The thing is you do, you put your, your board, make it nice and wet on both sides, and then you load up this gorgeous dough on top. So now, when you have it in there, you go, and you roll your dough towards the front. So then you go like this one more time, and then you take it off the edge. So you take it again like that, come down, and, and you just shave it down. And then the other thing is, when you make it, you always want to try to make them unorthodox. Otherwise, you could just buy them in a, in a, in a yeah, jar. Just buy them in the store. So good, like so. This shows the handmade. Exactly. And the flavor of those are spectacular because the amount of eggs we put in there. The name Spätzle comes from Sparrow. A Spatz in German is a sparrow. And when they first named it, nobody knows when it happened, they see the sparrow building his nest with a huge piece of hay. As this Spatzle cooks, it looks like the long piece of hay. Where I come from, this is our lifeline. No oh, Spätzle, sure. you can exist. Now imagine that and a spoon of the goulash on top. Ooh. You see, the dough is even, it gets better as it sits a little bit more, you can see it. You saw me, it blew bubbles when we took it out. Ideally, I say, if you make it, give it maybe, eh, say, 15, 20 minutes rest. Well, uh, Chef? I guarantee you're gonna pass the course before the day is over. <laughs> uh, right. Under your close watchful eyes, <laughs> Chef. No problem, you got it. You got it. Little sinner. It's from Volchan. From Vol, Chef Stein. Welcome to the Canal Tavern of Zor. This is our restaurant here. It was built in 1829 by the Society of Separatists to host people that came in on the canal boat. These are our famous Zor pretzels. These are the kind of pretzels they've made in Zor since their founding in 1817, made by a descendant, Nancy Wyatt, who's gonna show you later today how they're made. Wow. But these are excellent. They've been made in Zor since they arrived in 1817. What a unique flavor, rich. They are great. Beautiful, that's a spectacular pretzel, I tell you. Does it remind you of home? Big time. This whole place reminds me of home. I'm going to come back. <laughs> so, John, the canal actually changed life for the separatists a little bit. Well, you're absolutely right. It actually made life possible because up to the building of the canal, they were struggling with how they were going to repay their debt. And when the state came through and said, we're going to build this canal, and seven miles of it went through their land, the digging of that canal by them, and men and women both did it, that, first of all, gave them the money to repay their debt, so now they were free of that. And then, of course, it opened up trade for their agricultural goods all the way to Cleveland, all the way down, in theory, to New Orleans on the Ohio River. So the canal was godsend, right? It was a godsend. Eh, you know, again, maybe a little bit of a blessing and a curse. Yeah. It brought goods here and goods out. But it also started bringing visitors to Zor. That was the good thing because it brought revenue in and allowed them to uh, you know, use their agricultural goods in, in, in hospitality mm -hmm. industry, if you will. But at the same time, it also kind of led to its demise because those outside influences, they began to see a different world. They saw money being exchanged between people. It, it's pretty well believed that some of the employees that worked in the hotel probably were getting some cash tips and uh, started to see, oh, that's, that's kind of nice. And then also they started bringing in more, I'll say, you know, guest workers, not necessarily members of the society, but they needed them to work in the hotel. So, Chan, thank you for your hospitality. And it's just been great having you visit us. Michelle, congratulations. You passed the course. You're now the official sore Spätzle maker. Thank you, Chef. I'm so happy to have learned that from you. And the next one we're making is a Geisburger Marsch, which is obviously, again, one of my soul foods. And I'm getting desperate. It's a lot of work, as I know. I, I'm and sure. And the first thing you can do for me, you can make me Kartoffelschnitz. It's a Yukon and you cut it into pieces like that, I'm gonna get started on the chain of a beef tenderloin. And I'm cutting it in generous chunks. Just like that, perfect. 
I have some celery stock over there. I could put some in there too, if I feel like it. And a couple onions. And get the meat, stir up the meat really good. It's looking good, chef. Yep, thanks. Oh, it's smelling good. Three bay leaves. Not me. Five tons of pepper, at least. Four big pinches of salt, at least four. Everything that we chopped up can go in there right now. And if you can reach me the butter over. And it's gonna get a little bit of onions on top when it gets in the soup terrine. So now we just gotta wait for the potato to be ready because everything else will be ready. I'll give the onions some time to cook. Now obviously you see I made a huge pot. The separatists each had their own kitchens, but often there were more than one family living in a home at the time. This is the kitchen for the number one house and there were I believe about four families living in there and about 18 people. So they would have had a lot to feed. Now we're ready to plate it up. So what I'll do right now, I put a spätzle on the bottom. Look at that, oh gosh. Look at those cuts of meat. All I'm gonna do is cut a little bit of chive. All right. Wow. Spectacular, the flavor, the goodness of the dishes, the, the, the beef, the vegetables, the stock. It's just, I mean, speechless. A stew for all seasons. You better believe it. That's our goulash. Mm. See the carver seed, the lemon comes through. It don't get better than that. It does not. <laughs> it doesn't. Once I knew I was gonna come to Saar, where the separatists from Germany settled in 1817, I couldn't help myself to make one dish that has more memories than any of the dishes I've ever made. And it's called a Rossbraten. And basically what it is, it's a New York strip steak, but it has a little twist to it. And it's that the fat stays on it, and the fat is what gets the flavor. It's a food that you eat in Germany in a bar. It's like your chicken wings. We eat a Rosbrad. You go to a place, you, you get a Rosbrad with a slice of bread and a few beers, and you're happy. So it's really, really simple. Cutting it right now, very simple. I'm making two. What the whole thing is all about, that the fat stays on it, and you penetrate the outer skin exactly three times. One, two, three. And the reason you do that, because the vein in there is going to make the steak shrink together. One, two, three. You pound it out a little bit. Just like that. Now if I tell you I had to make literally hundreds of those at night in the family restaurant on a Saturday night, you won't even believe it. And now what I'm gonna do is get salt, good amount, both sides, and pepper. The flavor of that is very nostalgic. You have the Rosbraten plain, like I have in front of me, or Zwiebel, which means onion on top. But like I said, normally nothing else with it. Rosbraten number one. Rosbraten number two. And a little bit of parsley with a slice of bread. Oh. <laughs> now those are memories and beautiful. Mm. Todd, it's a pleasure to meet you. Chef Stay, welcome to the Zor Tinsmith shop. You know, this is my first time that I met a tin, what, what do you call yourself, a tin, tinsmith? Well, I'm a tinsmith. Uh -huh. um, there's also tinkers, who were the people that repaired the tin. I'm the actual person that makes it from the beginning. The tinker's not like Tinker Bell, though, right? No, not like Tinker Bell, just Tinkerer. It was the middle of the time, right? Yes, the primary method of the vessels in the kitchens from the period yeah. was the tin. The tin man was the Tupperware man of the 18th and yeah. 19th century. I remember in Europe that the tin guy came and refinished your pots. Yes. I mean, this is no good. I mean, people don't even realize that. Yes, and there's there's still tinkers that travel around yeah. Ireland. I'm making a Christmas angel for a tree topper for you uh -huh. that you'll be able to take and place on your Christmas tree this year. That's very good. 
it's completely handmade and hand folded. There's no soldering or anything to make oh. it work. So what I did was is, is a rough cut shape of an angel. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna let you finish this piece right here for me, just like cutting a piece of paper. All right, let me see if I can do that. It's not like cutting a noodle dough. Not like cutting a noodle, no sir. And now it's ready to go. I have what's called the Zor Star. It's a seven-pointed star. So basically it becomes the outline. So now I've created the seven point star now. What we want to do is we want to put a hole all the way through because if we put a light behind it, the lights will shine through. Give it one big wrap like you're cracking a walnut. So we've established our points. Between yeah. each one of these, we'll put a cut, just like that. This is how they cut their cheese graters, by hand. Amazing. And then what we do is we take it over here to a stake. But what I'll do is I'll just start right here like this and I'll just work it back and forth. Oh. So I want to get the wings to spread. This is called a hatchet stake. Now that way I can get a nice square edge. Look at that. Amazing how you capture my image so well. You're an angel. <laughs> but seriously, I want to thank you. Chef, I appreciate you coming here. You're more than welcome to come back to Zora Village anytime. But before you go, I have one more thing for you. For your culinary oh, adventures, a little my, scoop. My flower scoop. How nice is that? Beautiful. I could not leave Sora without really understanding the history of the Sora pretzel and meeting you, Nancy, thank who you. is a descendant an official pretzel maker of Zor, right? Well, my family has been making Zor pretzels for six generations. Whew. So I learned this from my mother. She learned it from her mother and her mother and her mother on back to actually the first child born in Zor, uh, which is where the recipe came from. The origin of the Zor pretzel is very interesting because in Germany, the monks actually used to make the pretzel for treats for their students who learned Bible verses. And that was the prize for learning their Bible verses. They prayed like this. So you can see the shape of the pretzel. So help me God? Yeah, you can see. <laughs> okay. So the first thing you do is you start with yeast and then you add uh, some sugar to that so the yeast will kind of explode in the dish. Then you begin adding flour. You end up with about five cups of flour, sometimes five and a half and uh, also a little bit of salt goes in here. Mm -hmm. And then the lard. Makes sense, you cannot make a good pie crust or anything without lard. Exactly, Impossible. because it lends you know, flakiness and yep. airiness. So what you do is you keep just working the flour mm -hmm. in. Gotcha. I have some made in advance to the way it will look after about 25 minutes to 30 minutes. And you can see how much it's expanded. Mm -hmm. And when you put your finger or thumb in, the indentation stays. So that way you know it's ready to roll out. So what you do is you just flour the board just a little. You just take off like an egg piece and you just start from the middle. Just and you it roll out. it out, yeah. Gently. The final thing you do is you kind of make these ends kind of sharp. You cross it, you cross it again, and then you bring your hands up on your shoulders. This is lye water and it's very diluted lye water and then we had taken out the onion skins because we just want the color we don't want the onion skins actually in there put it in the water like one pretzel at a time yeah one pretzel at a time put it on your and then you sheet. put it on a greased baking sheet like this. so you put the salt on mm -hmm. the stage they're ready for the oven which is at 425 degrees and you put them in for about eight minutes and your goal is to have them crisp on the outside and soft on the inside. Nancy, I've been cooking around all over the world for many, many years. It's my first lesson in pretzel making. But what do you have in your hands? It's for you. It is? Yeah. Gosh, you are some hostess here. <laughs> I learned how to make a pretzel, show me everything, and I get a sip of beer? Exactly. Fantastic, yeah. I tell you. That's a Zor tradition. Wow, what a great combination. All this for a spectacular taste of history from Saw Village in Ohio. <laughs>